pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, nice to see so many people stuck around for the ag talk. Uh, so hopefully we can make this interesting. And uh, I'm going to present actually uh, some some recent work, some of which is unpublished, and uh, how we're using glycomic or glyco-based tools uh, in our research. So if we consider how food is made, I'm sure we're capturing most of the representative sectors up here. Uh, this is from a review, actually, uh, we're, we're about to, to publish here. So we can consider that, you know, we can have primary production. So, you know, this is the, the growth, growth of crops or animal production in, the, in considering how our beef products or, or dairy, uh, poultry and swine. And so we're actually very interested in, you know, the interaction between these different ecosystems uh, and carbohydrates and and bacteria. So this is how we actually think about agricultural production in my group. So each of these different sectors, you know, if we consider number one here, which represents a feedstock, it's composed of carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates that we would find in the plant cell wall. In uh, section two, uh, we're considering the soil. So as plant cell wall material is directly deposited or turned over in the soil, we have the presence of, of exudates and, and plant cell wall material that's being decomposed or stimulating the growth uh, of, of microorganisms. So to study these interactions between how carbohydrates are made uh, and how they interact with, with uh, microbiomes, we need to be able to study the, the complex structure of, of glycans. And so there's a number of ways we can do this. So this is the, the launch of GIA. I thought we could go through some of these. And these these vary in sophistication and also expense. Um, and so in this case, we're, we're thinking about a very crude estimate of the, the types, the amount of carbohydrates that are present. And so using UV spec, you know, an instrument that's available in most labs, we can consider total sugar or things like uronic acid. Moving up a little bit in sensitivity, we can use HPLC to look at the, the products of digestion or whether that's fragmented by chemistry. And we can consider the types of oligosaccharides. So we can get structural information this way as well if we have the appropriate standards to compare them to. Uh, our lab uses also a lot of glycosidic linkage analysis. And this is a higher level of resolution in the sense that we can start to look at the, how carbohydrates are put together, so positional linkage within very complex biological samples. So that could be something like feed, or it could be in feces, the total tract indigestible residue. This is also some we can quantify the amount of, of linkages as well, which gives us an estimation of the types of polysaccharides that are present in our samples. A very common uh, state-of-the-art approach is LC-MSMS. Uh, so here this is very sensitive. It's giving us structural information. It's telling us what carbohydrates are DP, uh, how they're put together, um, again, to very high resolution. Standards, again, are important here. The gold standard for structural determination, of course, is NMR, and this gives us absolute structural information. Uh, things like, uh, you know, stereochemistry, monosaccharide composition. Uh, some of the limitations here are it's a, you know, specialized technique, but we need to be able to assign peaks, um, and it can take quite a, a long period of time for, for new structures. And the last method to consider here, and of course there, there's others, but um, this is what we call glycome profiling. So this is the use of um, antibodies or proteins with known specificity that we can use to bind to our substrates. And we get these readouts. So based on the, the available proteins and, and their known specificity, we can start to map out the absolute structure of some of our substrates. So each of these methods, as I mentioned, it has advantages and disadvantages. It has you know, different price points. It's dependent upon instrumentation. Um, and so what a lot of researchers will do is they'll rely on core services, one of which is available here through, through Glycanet, of course. Um, another lab that's, that's quite well known for core services is, at the, is the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center at the University of Georgia, which I had the pleasure of, of doing my second postdoc. And we've also actually established a, a core service as well at uh, the Lethbridge Research and Development Center, where we're focused on, as I said, glycosidic linkage analysis. So our, our, uh, our centers where our support unit is actually run by, by two analytical chemists, Mike Singh and, and Bobby, a recent graduate of U of A, actually. 
Okay, so let's look at a, some of these systems in a little bit more detail. And if we consider what's going on in poultry production, um, as Hans introduced, the role of mucins, these complex sugars that line the mucosal surface, and in this case, the gut of chickens, um, we have these complex uh, O and N glycan structures. Now, there's a, there's a pathogen called Clostridium perfringens um, that causes necrotic enteritis, which is also known as the billion dollar disease. It could be considered the multi billion dollar disease internationally. And Clostridium perfringens has this, this arsenal of enzymes that are known to attack the different glycans on the surface of the chicken gut. And in work uh, primarily pioneered by Al Borston and Steve Smith, and ongoing work funded by Glyconet. Uh, we've been looking at how these enzymes actually come together and work to, to deconstruct the, uh, the mucin layer and allow access to the, the epithelial, which is actually what leads to uh, necrotic lesions, uh, which leads to morbidity and, and uh, mortality. Another system we can consider is, is beef production. And so um, here we're considering, okay, what, what are they eating? So here we're looking at the plant cell wall material. We're very interested in what's getting turned over. Now the rumen is the most complex bioreactor known, uh, but still it's not, the, the feed is not completely digested. So we're interested in trying to understand the structures that are actually coming out of the animal uh, so we can start to look at ways to improve efficiency and extract more energy. So this is from a recent paper uh, we just published. And in this study, what we did was we want to understand uh, the, the plant cell wall structures, and we did comparative glycomics uh, on the total tract indigestible residue, which is a euphemism for fecal matter, basically. So we're looking at the, the polysaccharides that come out of the animal, and by comparing this, uh, we, can, we can start to identify uh, substrates that disappear more efficiently, as uh, so these are being digested rather, uh, rather well, and the ones that are accumulating are the ones that are impervious to, to digestion. So in order to find enzymes that might be helpful in, in digesting the residue, we cultivated rumen microbes on the purified polysaccharides out of that fecal material, uh, and we looked at what genes were turned on. We did some RNA-seq and some bioinformatic analysis to look at just the carbohydrate active enzymes to get an idea of what might help digest the, uh, the, the, the residual polysaccharides. So for the rest of the talk here, and you may have thought my, my title is a little bit strange, but what is the Salish Sea? We're here in Alberta. Um, we've actually been looking to the oceans for, for solutions to sustainable food production. And you know, if you consider seaweed, seaweed is an incredible bioresource. Uh, it grows rapidly, it sequesters carbon, it doesn't require arable land, it doesn't require fresh water or fertilizer. And in the context of producing beef, I, I'm sure some of you may have heard about how seaweed is actually a potent mitigator of methane emissions. I'm just curious, has anyone heard about seaweed for, for methane? Now, i just just clarify that it's actually only a couple of species of seaweed that do this well, um, but it is an incredible uh, inhibitor of, uh, of methane production. Now, we're also can, interested in actually the polysaccharides in seaweed. So not just can we mitigate methane, but can we actually find alternative feed sources that get digested and um, provide energy to the animal? So seaweeds are uh, weird and wacky. We call them exotic polysaccharides. These polysaccharides you do not find in terrestrial plants. Okay, so they're, uh, they're highly sulfated. They have a lot of L sugars and, and hydro sugars. So if you figure that, okay, here we have these, these exotic polysaccharides that aren't commonly seen by the gut microbiome, where do where the enzymes actually come from to digest these sugars? So in 2010, there was kind of a breakthrough paper in this area, uh, published by Jan Henrik Hiemann during his PhD, and they came up with this hypothesis that the genes from marine microorganisms were being transferred to the, the uh, bacteria in the, in the human gut. So they called this the sushi factor, and it became quite a sensationalized uh, story within the, uh, the microbial ecology world. In 2018, we published a follow-up paper to this. We were looking at agarose, which is uh, found in red seaweed, and we defined a pathway involved in the metabolism of agarose. And for some reason, uh, we, we, were, we were interviewed, and, and uh, 
for some reason, the, the journalists started to think we were doing this work in cattle, um, which we weren't at that time. So they called it the sushi factor for livestock or sushi cows. So I was trying to correct them, but I said, you know what, it's, I don't think it's worth it. Um, and I was actually, it was neat to see kind of how people caught on to this idea. And so we asked ourselves, why aren't we doing this work? And that kind of spawned actually the, the projects that I'm going to share with you here. Sushi cows. Okay, so in these projects, we're working with some remarkable collaborators and studying some amazing herds of animals that are actually consuming seaweed and other marine plants. So this is from uh, Mears Island, which is just off, off the, uh, um, the, the pier from Tofino. It's about a five minute boat ride. And there's wild cattle that live on this island that are eating seaweed and other marine plants. Uh, and that's a collaboration with the Tlaquia First Nation. In addition, we're working with Cascadia Seaweed, and they are uh, a cultivator of seaweed that works with First Nations. And their goal is to become the largest producer of, of cultivated seaweed in North America. And they're well on their way uh, towards that goal. And last but not least, this is an organic farm, uh, natural pastures. Um, and it's run by Edgar Smith, who's, who's a beef producer, but also kind of a closet scientist. So he's, enabled, he's allowed us to do some experiments and set up experiments on his farm. Now what Edgar is doing is he's feeding seaweed, um, that's an introduced seaweed called Mazella japonica, uh, to his animals as a feed source and looking at the impact on their production. Okay, so this is the big question I want everyone to think about during the rest of this talk. You know, most of beef production is happening in Alberta and Saskatchewan, okay? And so consider about 200 generations of animals have been fed terrestrial crop, crops, so, uh, you know, corn, barley, wheat, grass. And you have vertical transmission of the microbiota from the cow to the calf. And so you can, it's easy to imagine how you get very, very well adapted and specialized in the digestion of these types of feedstocks. So what happens then if you introduce this foreign material, these exotic polysaccharides, to this production chain? Can they digest it? If they do, how, right? So digestion is actually going to rely on genes, encoding enzymes, found in, in the rumen bacteria. Okay, so do these genes involved in metabolism of seaweed exist on farm? Question one, and if, if they do, where do they come from? And this is actually the question that, that's kind of driving this whole research area. We've come up with three hypotheses. One is there's environmental bacteria found on the surface of seaweed or contaminating the sample. You know, the cow would eat it, and these bacteria would assist with digestion in the gut. However, most marine bacteria are aerobic, um, so they wouldn't survive in the rumen, which is an anaerobic, and they're not adapted to the environment, which is highly competitive. Is there a dynamic transfer of genes from, from the environmental bacteria to the, the rumen bacteria? So this would be analogous to the sushi factor hypothesis, but this would require rapid horizontal gene transfer. We're talking on the order of hours. And a third hypothesis is that these bacteria that have these, this catalytic potential persist in the rumen at low levels. So think about it like this genetic dark matter that exists below the limit of detection maybe going back to some ancestral wild cow. Uh, and these have been passage through the animal, but you can only see them when they're actually proliferated or selected for. So we have this amazing ecosystem that we get to study. And this is based on the, the beaver meadow farms. Um, and so we started at the oceans. This is uh, the Salish Sea. So the Salish Sea is actually the, the east coast of Vancouver Island, the west coast of the mainland, down into the Seattle Puget Sound area. And it's been renamed in honor of the, the traditional name of the Coast Salish people. So we studied um, the environment that the seaweed grows in. We, we followed it through into the animal so that the, the cow was fed the seaweed, mixed, a mixed ration. So we're studying the rumen. Uh, we studied the feces to get an idea of what the bacteria community in the, in the, in the lower intestinal tract is like. And then we followed it right through into the compost and into the soil to look at this dynamic transfer of genes potentially from, from the ocean through the animal into the soil. Now this project would not be possible without Edgar Smith, so he's the, this, this uh, closet scientist I told you about, he's running uh, Beaver Meadow Farms, and then his postdoc Spencer Searin, 
and then the, the hard work of Jeff Tingley, who's a PhD student in my group. Okay, so this is a picture of the beach and the Salish Sea, where, and this is actually Mazella japonica, which is this introduced seaweed um, from Japan. It was brought over by Japanese oyster fishermen. And the BC government's quite concerned about it because it is introduced and it grows rapidly, uh, and there's no kind of natural predation going on. So this actually will form these massive blooms and then wash up on the beach during a wreck, as a wreck during a storm. So the BC government is looking for ways that we can actually convert this into useful products. This is the, I, I keep, this was the, the beaver meadows herd that, for this study. As we know uh, what happens to beef, uh, they are no longer with us. But uh, these, he, has, he has other herds that he's maintained for the last few years. And so what happens is we collect the seaweed and uh, well, primarily Spencer will load it into the conveyor belt. It shoots up here into the dryer. It gets uh, chopped and milled and bagged. So it can be stored for longer, long periods of time uh, and also shipped. So we're able to ship some to us in Lethbridge. So the first question we asked is, what are the structural carbohydrates of this introduced seaweed? So we primarily have done a glycosidic linkage analysis here. And what we're showing in red, these are the galacti galactose derivatives. And in green, these are the anhydro sugars, which you find in, in red algal galactan. So there's really no surprises here. Um, but we were able to show that there are kind of some enriched uh, linkages. And if we map them out onto the carrageenans here, um, there's a primarily kappa carrageenan, iota carrageenan, and, and lambda carrageenan. But there's also trace amounts of other carrageenans as well. So all you need to remember is carrageenans are highly diverse, structurally complex, highly sulfated. And you also have this anhydro um, bridge as well in, in some. So M. japonica, enriched and diverse carrageenans, uh, primarily kappa, iota, and lambda. This will come in, into play uh, in a few slides. Uh, we're also working on some other uh, methods to characterize structure, including NMR and LCMS. OK, so we have a good idea now of the, the carbohydrates, the polysaccharides that are there. We next wanted to see, OK, do these sugars have any impact on the microbiota of these animals? And if so, can we get down actually to the gene level to start reconstituting enzymatic pathways that would be required for digesting these carrageenans? So we, we had two uh, ways to study this, and this was on pasture. Okay, so on pasture, uh, and this is, this is a problem actually for people that study beef research, is you can't control what the cow's eating. They love grass. And so you stick this additive out there in the, in the field, and unless there's a way to attract the animal to it, they're only going to eat it if they want to. So it's, it's called a libitum, right? They eat it if they want. Um, and so you get a lot of diversity within the herd. Maybe one day they eat a lot, the next day you know, they don't eat it for four days. So it, it, it creates some complexities in studying these systems. Um, but we did see a small difference between animals that were in a paddock without seaweed and, and those that, were, that had it. And we see a, um, a small bump here in the, in the Bacteroidiaceae. So we decided we needed to set up a second experiment. And this is where Edgar really comes into play, because uh, he, he supports this type of work on his farm. Uh, and what we wanted to do was actually put the seaweed into the feed. So then we can regulate, OK, how much seaweed would they be eating? And you can monitor how much they eat to get an idea of actually how much seaweed's passaging through the animals. And he had two barns set up, one uh, that had mazella. Uh, Japonica in it and one that did not. So we could directly compare the impact of the seaweed on the animals. And we see some small changes here when we're looking at all taxa, but when we blow this up to the bacteroidetes, you can start to see some, some big jumps in the animals that were fed the seaweed. And the reason this is important um, is that most of the, the seaweed pathways, the seaweed uh, digestion pathways that have been mapped have actually fallen into the bacteroides species. So here again, we're seeing this, this response in Bacteroides, uh, which is you know, in agreement with what was seen in, in humans and mice. So we did shotgun metagenomics. And um, we actually, well, Jeff was able to put together 460 different uh, mags, or microbial assembled, assembled genomes. And when we dereplicate those, we found 76 uh, independent or, or individual mags. These are mapped here onto the tree, and we've been able to show where, whether they came from feces or rumen, uh, and then the different, and the different phyla that are here. So the key point uh, from all of this is that we found 
one bacterium, one strain, and in that bacterium there was this, uh, what we call it BX mag for Bacteroides xylanus solvens, and in this mag we found one pathway of, that was of great interest to us. Okay, so shown in blue here, these are glycoside hydrolases, and then up in this corner, these are the, the enzymes that would be required to digest the different linkages that we know are present in, in the seaweed. So here's our kappa, iota, and lambda carrageenans, uh, and then the different families of enzymes, and you can try to map them down into here, or you can just believe me when I tell you that they are there. Okay, this is very exciting. So we've got this, this pathway now that would be required. We found evidence for it. So the next thing we asked is, okay, well, the, the bug exists. Can we isolate the bug out of these microbial communities? So then, again, this was Jeff's brainchild. So we uh, uh, extracted the polysaccharide goo. It's quite gelatinous. These carrageenans, are, they form a gel. Uh, and then he used that as a sole carbon source in anaerobic tubes that were brought over from Lethbridge. Now, remember, we're in Lethbridge. The animals are in, on the west coast of BC. Okay, so there's some, uh, some challenges with that. So we set up a, a remote uh, water bath, and this is actually a sous vide, keeping this water bath at temperature. <laughs> the sous vide was, uh, well, this was at the, the rental, but then was plugged into the car inverter and we drove it. Well, well he drove it, I, I flew. <laughs> uh, but I uh, drove it all the way back to Lethbridge, and so these are the, uh, the tubes that are, uh, the fecal samples that are getting enriched for this, for this polysaccharide. Once we got back to the lab, then he was able to start doing some isolations, and this is just restreaking. It's quite laborious. But at the end of all this, we were able to discover five uh, strains that were isolated using various carrageenan, so these are commercial, uh, commercially available, or also the M, M. japonica seaweed extract. Okay, so and from these, um, so these are growing only on the carrageenan or the extract, right? And from these, the, there's two that we're going to talk more about in detail here. So we've got a BX, so these again were Bacteroides xylanus solvens. We called it CAR5 and for carrageenan, uh, 5 and 17 here. So Jeff grew these on uh, the, the different uh, sugars that they were used to isolate. So this is the, the extract again, and then different commercially available carrageenans. This is just a positive control. They all do quite well on, and this is a negative control. So this is a Bacteroides species that does not have this pathway. Okay, so we're, we're looking at these two. CAR5 does quite well in the extract. 17, not so well, but it does grow. Uh, we see a difference here in IOTA. Um, they both grew on Lambda. Uh, and then here, this was a bit of a challenge because Kappa actually comes out of solution in, in, with, the, with the medium. Uh, so the salts or something's going on to draw it out of solution, which made this this dip growth quite difficult to, to determine, but this is actually not bacterial growth. This is just precipitation of sugar. So uh, Jeff had the genome sequenced, and then he did his, his mining again to look for pathways, and we found two, uh, well, we found uh, carrageenan pathways in both organisms, and there's a fair amount of, of syntony here. There is some specialization, as you can tell, in CAR15. Uh, we're also seeing some evidence for uh, some of the, the elements required to bounce these things in and out of genome. So that's shown, uh, I think, with these guys. And then when we map them to the, the mag that we got from shotgun metagenomics, again, at, consistently we're seeing these syntenic regions, but again, there is specialization. So there is, you know, strain variability going on uh, between, these, between these bugs. Um, which also indicates that there's probably some specializations that are present. So we're just going to focus here now on, on this, the uh, three prime end of these pathways. Uh, so this is our mag, and this is CAR5. Now, this gene I've highlighted, this is called GH16 subfamily 17. Why do we care? Well, this is actually an enzyme that, that fragments carrageenan polysaccharide. So it's upstream in the pathway. And if we compare these two these two pathways, that we have 100% con uh, conservation between the isolated bug and the, the bug that was sequenced. If we compare this to 17, however, it's lost one of these GH17s, and the one that it does have, GH16 subfamily 17, and the one that it does have is 65% identical. So this is kind of a drop-off in its, its relatedness and potentially its function. So we were quite curious about this. 
Now, to study differences in sequences and potential function and to help us predict function from, from large data sets, we've developed this program called SECARIS, um, which stands for Sequence Analysis and Clustering of Carbohydrate Active Enzymes for Rapid Informed Prediction of Specificity. Um, I'm very happy with this acronym this way. I always insist on <laughs> reading it out. Um, we published this in 2018. Now, we hired a student from UBC uh, in collaboration with Harry Brummer uh, this summer who turned out to be an absolute whiz. We, uh, we wanted to upgrade Sakaris, so this is Sakaris 2.0. Uh, and this is how it works, okay? So you, you have your collection of genes. It could be, you know, something you take out of the data set, database. It could be some, a genome you sequenced. It could be a metagenomic data set. It could be transcriptomics. It could be proteomics, whatever you, you decide you're looking at. Um, and then we, we annotate it into, into uh, open reading frames. And then there's a, a casome analysis. So this is going to pull out all the carbohydrate active enzymes. And then those are parsed into uh, your casome from your data set. So what we call your user sequences. These are combined with the KZ sequences. So it actually, Sakaris goes and grabs all the related sequences from the KZ database, prunes them down with, with dbcan. So we're just looking at the, the functional module, that part of the enzyme. We do an alignment, some, some model testing, uh, two ways to plot the tree, and then we uh, or build the tree and, then, and plot it with ggtree, which is in R. So this is all automated. Um, and the beautiful thing is that we can loop it for every single family. So let's say you have 50 different families of sequences in your data set. This will run through them all sequentially, and you get your entire k-zone built. And what Sakaris basically is, it's an automated tree builder. So this allows you to actually compare your individual sequences with the characterized sequences that are available in the database. What's new? Uh, we have this explore mode I talked about. The tree building is actually automated now in R. So this puts all the, the EC numbers, the functional characterization with your sequence. Uh, we've upgraded all the bioinformatics tools and we've got these quality of life upgrades so I'm just going to share a little bit about here. So we now have a new interface. This is a GUI that's locally installed. Before it was all command line, which was real. This was really an issue for a lot of people trying to use Sakaris independently. But now the, the vision is that people can install this on their own computer. It's an interactive uh, uh, GUI, so kind of interface here. Um, another nice feature is that we've, we've built these kind of categories which are substrate dependent. So maybe you're interested in xyloglucan uh, or a plant cell wall kind of study. Here we're looking at red al algal galactans and we've populated this, this category with all the known families of casimes involved in the digestion of that sugar. You can actually make your own. You can add, subtract families from this list as well, which is shown here. And then also we've got this tracked, tracking runtime progress meter now. So you can actually see what family's done, what one is it working on, and how many left to go. Before it was this black box where you would just say start and you didn't know if it was done until it was done or if it crashed, if it crashed. And it could take three weeks, it could take a week. So it was quite frustrating. Okay, and actually it's also coming now for, for Windows and Mac. So we think these are real advances to the tool. This is the type of output we get, okay? So just to circle back again, we're looking at subfamily 17 of GH16. All of these are characterized sequences that have been pulled out of KZ, and we're just zooming in here on one, on one clade. Okay, so red, these are kappa carrageenanases. There's one lambda carrageenase that's been described as well. And then in white, this is the user sequences from Jeff's mag and Jeff's isolates. Uh, that are getting mapped to the characterized sequences. So you can just look at a blow-up view here. Um, we've got our CAR5 and our BX mag. Again, we've got 100% identity, 100% uh, identity for both of, those, both of those enzymes. So that's an agreement. SP2 means this is on the surface of the cell. SP1 means it's predicted to be inside the cell. So we've got identical enzymes outside the cell and inside the cell, probably catalyzing similar reactions. When we look at our CAR-17, uh, this one at 65 percent, it shows very high identity to the lambda carrageenanase. So what's pretty interesting here is we think we've got two groups of enzymes that are active on kappa, and then we've got the, 
the one uh, that's active on lambda. Okay, and these are quite structurally distinct substrates. So we uh, cloned the enzyme and did some digests, and when we, we put in the Mazella japonica and the kappa carrageenan, our, uh, our single enzyme we're testing here, is actually working quite well. And you're seeing actually these products are pretty similar. So it's again an agreement that there's a lot of kappa carrageenan in M. japonica. This result was, uh, was surprising actually, that we saw activity on um, iota and then even uh, lambda here giving different product profiles. So this it looks like actually a, a promiscuous enzyme active on multiple forms of, of carrageenan, which ha actually hasn't been described to our knowledge. We characterize these products uh, just by indirect, direct injection. We don't have the tick for this, unfortunately. For, we'll get into that. There's a lot of time. Uh, but we were able to show the structural information uh, in agreement with, with this digest, showing that, yes, these are carra oligosaccharides being released. So then our next thought was, okay, what happens if we put this enzyme back into the growth of, of these isolates? And uh, I've, I've indicated the, the changes here with an arrow. The blue is with enzyme, the red is just the, the cells on their own. So when it's grown on M. japonica, not much change, but we do see this boost here with uh, iota and also kappa. So again, we had this issue with the, the sugar coming out of solution but here with the enzyme, it actually seems to solubilize the products that now the bug can grow on quite well. We saw similar kind of boosts here on iota, uh, M. japonica, and kappa, suggesting again that the enzyme's helping release kappa oligosaccharides from, from uh, the different sugars. So we uh, next wanted to look at the, uh, the direct interactions of the sugars from the seaweed with the bacterial cell. And this is a method we've developed, it's called FLAPS. So we fluorescently label the sugars and then we feed it to the cells. And this can be done in mixed communities as well. Uh, this was a collaboration with the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology. Uh, primarily this work has been catalyzed by uh, Greta Renges, who went, uh, had a Mary Curie to come visit us for two years. So here's the, the reaction chemistry. What it does is it stochastically adds a fluorophore to the polysaccharide and it generates a library of fluorescent probes that the cells can sample. And so we're relying on the, the specificity of the transporters and the enzymes to recognize these probes, digest them, import them. And this can be done, like I said, in a mixture of substrates or, or, uh, or species. And if there is import of, this, of the fluorescent polysaccharide or the flaps, we get this kind of halo-like effect, which allows you to directly visualize polysaccharide interact. And we've used it now to, to map out import or transport efficiency and, and define different foraging types and uh, total accumulation and rate of uh, import of polysaccharides. We've also used it now to sort cells so we can get enriched metabolic communities by pulling out the cells that are fluorescent for our polysaccharide. And that work is to be published soon, hopefully. We've generated a, a large library of different polysaccharides, so maybe some of these jump off the page if you're interested, uh, including now even gram-positive bacteria. Uh, so we've done it with inulin and bifidobacter, and this is actually C. perfringens. So remember back to that story about the chicken. Uh, and the, the mucin, we've labeled oglycans and been able to show import into C. perfringens. So many different probes available now uh, for studying polysaccharide me metabolism. So they generated a probe, uh, so this is dried Mazella japonica, labeled it, uh, purified it, and then fed it to, oh sorry, first just to show that this is, uh, this is labeled carrageenan, and this is overlaid with uh, with bacterial cells, so we're staining the cells in DAPI. Uh, so we did this, we have a probe for ca commercially purchased carrageenan, but also the Mazella japonica extract. And actually what's kind of cool here is you can see this pocking that's going on, that the cells are colonizing the, the sugar, which actually is a bit of a gel in solution. So we have these probes in hand, um, and we decided to look at the rumen of the animals from Beaver Meadows, which is still underway. But what I'm gonna share with you is uh, some, some work we did with adapting naive cattle. So these again, this cow, this cow was from Lethbridge, born and raised, you know, 100 years uh, on the prairie. Never seen a, polysac or a seaweed polysaccharide before. We had some of the seaweed shipped. And we set up these artificial rumen chambers. So 
We can take the rumen community out of the cow and then ex vivo create these artificial rumens and start to put in different uh, crazy amounts of seaweed or other additives if you want to look at digestion in the rumen. Interestingly, we, we saw the cell count went up uh, when we added seaweed, uh, showing that there's proliferation of cells. However, we didn't see much change at the 16S level. When we added our, when we looked at the cells under the epifluorescent scope, actually it's a super resolution here, uh, we were able to show uptake though of, of our fluorescent polysaccharides. So what, what we're showing in cyan here, this is the DNA, uh, this is Bacteroides fish probe, so we have some taxonomic information. And then in yellow, you can see overlaid, that's actually the Mazella japonica polysaccharides that have been fluorescently tagged. So we're showing this beautiful overlay here of, of cells that are metabolizing the seaweed. And again, this is coming from a microbial community that had never seen this seaweed before. So we're definitely showing that they exist, um, even in animals that are naive to the polysaccharide. Um, and in this case, we're seeing this new cellular morphology that we hadn't seen before, which is quite cool. And it's reproducible. So this is a different seaweed from a different project, Saccharina latissima, also from the Salish Sea. Uh, and what we're looking at here in blue is the, the bacterial cells. In green, this is our fluorescent uh, sugar kelp. Okay, so this is a reproducible phenomenon, completely different sugars. Um, and again, we're having rumen mac microbes adapt and consume it. We've looked at two different herds, okay, so we had uh, an a, a set of animals that were eating seaweed about 50 kilometers away from the source. We've looked at this phenomenon in animals that are about 1,400 kilometers away that had never seen seaweed before. And I'll remind you there's actually a, there's a mountain range between where we got the seaweed <laughs> from as well. So I think hopefully I've convinced you that these seaweed consuming rumen bacteria exist in both naive and adapted cattle. We're very curious how far these relationships extend throughout the animal kingdom. So actually, is, are these events, hap, did they happen at, at, you know, in an ancient ancestor and they've just been uh, you know, carried through at low levels into modern day cattle? And we're still working on these three hypotheses. So I didn't give you an answer, but, but we're, look, we're trying to understand if these are the result of rapid evolution, uh, microbial transfer between environments, or is it selection for microorganisms that exist at very low levels? So this is my amazing team. This, it's actually a bit of a dated picture now, but many of them are still with me. Uh, Bobby's fairly new, and Alex, of course, is the, uh, the fellow that, that did all that great work with Sakaris 2.0, and the flaps work was, was uh, carried out by Leanne and Greta. So I just want to thank uh, our funders uh, and all our amazing collaborators in Agriculture Agri Canada and several different academic institutions. So thank you for your attention.